Well, before we get started, I want to say thank you to our veterans. This is Veterans Weekend, and uh, those men and women, yeah. They have served and sacrificed so that we can be here, and that's pretty awesome. So thank those guys, if you see them, and girls, for the service that they've done. All right, well, let's get started. Let me ask you a question. How difficult would it be to explain to someone how to tie their shoe if you couldn't show them or demonstrate? Like if you're trying to tell them, okay, you take this lace and you wrap it over the other and then back underneath and then the cross is around and it would be very difficult to do that. It would be difficult to teach someone to ride a bike without some sort of demonstration if you had to just kind of explain what it looks like to balance and where the pedals are and where the handlebars and how to steer and do all of those things without actually showing them how to do it. Think about this. It would even be difficult to explain to someone the directions left and right without actually indicating in some form or fashion which direction it is. There are some things that are better demonstrated then explain. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Philippians chapter 2. We're in the second week of our sermon series, Centered, where we're preaching chapter by chapter through the book of Philippians. And this book of Philippians is actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi somewhere around 60 to 62 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And this is a church that Paul knew really well because he had actually started this church about 12 years before he wrote this letter. And Philippians 2 is one of my very favorite parts of the entire Bible. I know I say that this is my favorite verse a lot, so that, that there's some truth to that even though it's different, but this really is one of my favorite parts of the Bible because it's got this beautiful, poetic illustration of who Jesus is and what he's done. In fact, it's so poetic that a lot of uh, Bible scholars believe that maybe this wasn't actually Paul's words, but that it was maybe part of a song that was sung by the early church and that Paul just took the lyrics and worked that into his letter. But I, I disagree with those theologians because I think if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love, you can see that Paul's pretty pro poetic when he wants to be. And so I believe these are his words inspired by God. But there's incredible depth to Philippians chapter 2, and it can be understood on different levels. The first level is it is deep theological truth about who Jesus is, what he came to do, and how he has been exalted. It is this deep understanding of the gospel all tied up in this little short phrasing. It describes his equality with God, how he was coexistent with God, and at the same time, he was all man. So when he came to earth, he was 100% God, 100% man. I have no idea how that works but I also don't understand how to build a star, so I'll leave that up to God. And then we are reminded of his obedience to the will of the Father, how he went to the cross in obedience. And then we're told how he is exalted by God because of going to the cross and rising from the dead, and how one day he will return as the acknowledged King of kings and Lord of lords, and every person will bow down at that moment and proclaim him as king. And so it's got this incredible doctrinal theology packed in just a few verses. But that's not really the reason that Paul wrote this letter. He actually wrote it to be very practical. And that's the second level that we can read it on is really Paul's intent. Paul did not think he could describe what it looks like to really live in a way that we're called to be centered on the gospel. So instead of trying to describe it chapter after chapter, he actually gives us the perfect description of that and the perfect illustration of that through the life of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we see here. This little section, verses 5 through 11, is the central passage of all of this book of Philippians. Everything else flows out of this because this is the gospel from which we are centered, and then our life, our actions, our speech, everything flows out of that. And he gives us this beautiful illustration of what it looks like. All right, let's dive in. This is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So I love what Paul does here. He gives us three or four rhetorical statements and says that those things ought to drive our lives. And so he says, look, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, of course they were encouraged by being united with Christ. He says, if you have any comfort from his love, well, of course the Philippians have comfort from God's love. We do too. His point is this, let those four things drive how you live. Because of those things, then we should live lives of sacrifice and service to one another. Because the natural human desire, the way we initially think, is to look out for number one, to take care of number one. And so what Paul is saying here is that these rhetorical statements should drive us to live differently than what the world looks like, to not put ourselves first, but to put others first. And then in verse 5, he's going to set up this picture or this illustration of what it looks like. So he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. If you want to live out the gospel, he's saying, it's Jesus. Living like Jesus is being centered on the gospel. And so he's saying, look, I can't really describe in words what that looks like, but I can sure give you an example of what that looks like in the person and presence of Jesus Christ. And so that's how he's telling us that we should live. It's the model for us. All right, look at verses 6 through 11. This is the gospel, all right here, and this is what it means to be centered on the gospel. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What we have here is a brief description of the gospel that we're to be centered on. And what we see is that this illustration, this picture that's given us, is borne out or it's modeled and illustrated in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. We see Jesus' life, story after story, where he lives this out. We see it from his very birth, when he was the king of kings and lord of lords, and he was born in a barn. Let's not call it a stable. It's a barn. Stable gives us this little picture of what's on our mantle. He was born in a barn. There were stinky animals around. There was poop around. It was not clean. It was not nice. The king of kings and lord of lords was born in a barn. And that servant attitude went all the way through his life until... He was nailed to a cross and died for our sins. That's what this looks like, and that's what our lives should look like. And and here's why this should be such a compelling example for us. Jesus is the star of the show. He is the central character in the story that God has been writing since the very beginning of time to the very end of the time. And, And so the point is, whatever you've done, you can't stick. You being three-time league bowling champion, you may be pretty proud of those trophies. You can't stick with Jesus. Whatever you've done, it pales in comparison. And the point is, if Jesus is God of the universe, if it's not beneath him to serve and love others, boy, it's sure not beneath us either. And, And so I really want to focus on the specifics of how this breaks down, why his sacrifice becomes this perfect model for us to have a gospel-centered life. Here's the first thing. He sacrificed to show us how to be present. If you guys ever watched that show, it's not around anymore, called Undercover Boss. Did y'all ever watch that? Yeah, it was a pretty cool show, actually, that they would have some CEO or president that would be undercover in his company. I actually have a book from Larry O'Donnell, who was the first undercover boss. Uh, a friend of mine is a friend of Larry O'Donnell's, and he got me an autographed book where he talked about, it was a book called Management Waste, and it was based on, he was president of Waste Management, a huge company here in Houston, Texas. But if you are unfamiliar with that show or you've kind of forgotten it, here's how it worked a CEO or the president of some big, big company with tens of thousands of employees would leave their big corporate office and they would go undercover 
and they would go to work in a warehouse or a storefront, and they would make pizzas, or they would uh, pick up trash, or they would clean toilets, right alongside entry-level employees, some of the lowest employees in the com company. And no one would know that they were actually the CEO or the president. And so it's a pretty cool concept that these guys would get out of their uh, big ivory offices with their big degrees, and they would work right alongside people who had no idea who they were. And their stated purpose for this, I mean, let's be honest, besides getting their 15 minutes of fame by being on TV, their stated purpose was to see what the, the low-level employees thought about the company and the corporate identity. And so they would do this, and it was a neat job, or it was a neat show because we got to see them having a nine-to-five job, and it was pretty cool. We don't expect corporate executives to leave their fancy offices and pick up garbage and do uh, regular labor. And, and if you think about this story of Jesus, it's a little like that, but, but way bigger than that. It, it's like undercover boss on steroids because Jesus is God of the universe, which is way bigger than a CEO or a president of some big company. And God used Jesus to reveal himself to us. But he didn't just reveal himself to us. He came and lived with us and made himself more like us so that we could understand who he is. He came from heaven and lived with us. Look at verse 6 again. Let's break that down. It says, Jesus, who being in very nature with God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The word that is translated into used his, to his own advantage is the Greek word harpogmos. And it literally translates to a prize or treasure that's been taken or stolen. It's the only time this word is used in the entire Bible. And here's how it kind of plays out. Jesus was co-equal with God. He had full divinity and he was living in that divinity in heaven. But rather than hanging on to that prize, that deity, he gave up much of that power and much of that glory and honor to come live with us, and he left heaven. He, he didn't hold on to that. He voluntarily gave that up. Think about how crazy that is. The, the God of the universe who made everything left the perfection of heaven for the imperfection of earth where he could feel sickness and pain. He went from a place that he was worshipped by thousands upon thousands of angels to a place where he was mocked and beaten and spit on. He left the beauty of heaven for the difficulty of earth. And, and Jesus leaving he heaven is what separates Christianity from every other religion. Our God didn't just tell us how to live. He came and showed us how to live. And this is also a reason that you can be comfortable with what we believe about Jesus. Because he lived on earth, and there's lots of historical documents about his birth, his life, his death, and yes, his resurrection. And so we can feel confident and comfortable with what we believe because this separates our belief in Jesus from every other religion. Because God became man, and we know he was here. So here's the practical part. We said that Paul was making this practical. And here's the practical part of verse 6. Jesus leaving heaven and coming to earth, that's the example for us. This example that he set is so countercultural for us today because you can pretty much live life and never leave your home. Think about all the things you can do without leaving home now. You can order meals. Now, in the old days, it was just pizza. Now you can order steak or whatever else that you might want. You can order prescription drugs. You can order your groceries. You can order Christmas presents. Some of you figured out you can work from home, never leave the house. And some of you guys have figured out that you can go to church in your pajamas <laughs> while live streaming TV. We can do a whole lot of our life online in our home. And that's okay in some moderation, but you cannot love like Jesus and stay at home. You have to leave where you are to love other people. Man, that's why our church gives you so many opportunities, not just to leave your house, but to leave this room, to leave this place and go and serve other people. We serve with a mission partner called Hope Impacts. You heard about the $25 gift drive that we're doing. We serve with them at suppers and showers, and we go to where homeless people are, and we serve them, and we engage with them, and we get to know them. And because of that, 
We have some people that we met there that are in our church now. We've baptized some people that we connected with through that ministry. Here's something really cool I want to share with you. Because of our close connection with Hope Impacts as a church, the executive director has asked that starting in 2024 that we be the church that provides communion for them and who baptizes the people that decide to follow Jesus through their ministries. But that only happens because we left here and went there. You can't do it just sitting here. You can't do it sitting in your home. There's another ministry that we connect with where we go somewhere. Hearts for Heroes. We go to downtown Houston to help serve some veterans that are in a facility that's government subsidized to keep them off the streets. We go there, we help with Bible study. And because of that, some of those veterans, they're now come to church every Sunday out here. We are their church. They drive from downtown Houston and carpool, or they pay to take an Uber to get to this church because we're their church family. But that only happened because we went to them. And now they come to us. That's the way that works. And I love that. I I was, my heart was actually broken not too long ago. One of the veterans was telling my my wife why they love our church. And they said, different churches will come and do stuff for us. But it doesn't feel like those churches really want us to be part of who they are. Your church, you're excited that we're here. Man, that's the church we want to be. We are going to them, and then they come back here to be a part of this family. We welcome them. When we leave this place to serve others, we're showing them that they're worth us getting out of our comfort zone, worth us leaving this place. It's what Jesus did for us. He left his house to come to us. And and can I let you in on a little secret? Your house is a dump compared to his. He had a really nice place that he left to come and show us what that looks like. So when we leave this place and go serve others, we're painting a picture of the gospel. We're showing them what that looks like by the way we live. And look, we we want you to go with us to serve in these different ministries and be a part of that. But you don't have to wait on a church event to get out of your comfort zone and to go serve other people. I love the way this church has been rallying around people who are hurting and going through difficult things. I I love one of our members, Cynthia Sullivan. Her husband uh, was in the end stages of cancer in in that battle, and then he passed on. And the way our church rallied around them, they took him to doctor's appointments before he died. They cooked meals for them. They cleaned their house. They mowed their yard. They encouraged them. They supported them. They came over and prayed with them. When Cynthia was telling me how our church had rallied around them, I had tears of joy running down my face as she was describing it because we are becoming the church that I prayed that we would be when we started this place. We cannot stay in our comfort zone and the convenience of our homes and live like Jesus. We have to be present for the people around us. We can't camp out in this church building and be the church that God wants us to be. We cannot come in here and feel good about ourselves on Sunday morning, sing a few empty songs and leave and live like Jesus. That's not how it works. We are the church because we leave here and we go out there and we change the world when we do it. We won't change our community. We won't change our world by sitting here. We won't change our world by sitting in our homes. We have to show people what the gospel looks like by being present for them. So here's what's so cool about this command that we connect with other people and that we serve them is that we actually get a bigger blessing when we do that than the people we're serving. You may not know that, but I'm not telling you Bible truth here. I'm about to tell you scientific studies. So first of all, just getting out and being around other people. The CDC did a study of the COVID-19 lockdowns and the impact that it had on people during that period of time. And and here's what they found. 41% of Americans, so almost half, experienced anxiety and depression during that period of time. 26% of Americans either started a struggle with alcohol or drugs or had their struggle get worse during this period of time. That's one out of four, over one out of four. We were not made to sit alone at home. We were made to be out, to live in community, to be around other people. That's how we're wired. And then other studies show that we derive these huge personal benefits from serving others. 
There was a 2016 study from the Journal of Behavioral Medicine. It examined the impact of serving other people on our brains. And so they did MRI and CAT scan imaging. And what they found is that when we're actively serving other people, the pleasure centers in our brain are lighting up way different than anything else we can do. And they found that our bodies release in something called endorphins when we serve other people. And those endorphins make us feel good, but they also do more than that. They restore and regenerate our bodies and our brain. It's very healthy for us to serve other people. A separate 2016 study by the National Alliance on Mental Health found that when we serve other people, our sense of purpose and fulfillment skyrocket. Well, that just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If we were created to be together and to serve other people, doesn't it make sense that we're going to derive a personal benefit? But I'm not telling you, this is not Bible truth. This is modern science proving the blueprint that Jesus gave us 2,000 years ago. It is better to give than to receive. That's what we're living out. That's what we see. Jesus wired us to get out and show intentional grace to others one person at a time. And so it only makes sense that our bodies and our minds benefit from that. When we do what we were created to do, we're blessed. Another way to say that is when we're on mission, things go well for us. All right, so Jesus sacrificed to demonstrate how to be present for other people. Here's another reason Jesus lived a life of sacrifice. He sacrificed to show us how to live. See, Jesus didn't come to earth to be celebrated as a king. He came to serve other people. He came to show intentional grace. His ministry was filled with healing, teaching, and just showing grace and love to people one person at a time. That's what it looked like when he did that. And that's the example for us. And so Paul is explaining that to us in Philippians 2.7. So he says, Jesus didn't hold on to his divinity. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet, his entire ministry here on earth was filled with intentional grace to others. That's what it looked like. And look, if you spent any time in church, you've heard this word grace thrown around. It gets used a lot. Our church name is Karis City Church. Karis is the Greek or the New Testament word for grace. You hear it thrown around, but what does it really mean? Our mission statement as a church is we want to show intentional grace to others one person at a time. But, but what does that look like? You know, the Bible actually talks about grace a lot. The word grace is used about 132 times in the New Testament, most of those by the Apostle Paul trying to explain it, what it looks like. Paul uses the word grace over 100 times in his letters trying to explain what grace looks like, what intentional grace looks like. But you know what's interesting about Jesus? Did you know Jesus never uses the word grace in his teaching? Not one single time does he use the word grace in his teaching. Instead, he shows us. He's the model. So time after time, story after story, we see Jesus paint this picture of what it looks like to show intentional grace. And, and I think when you hear some of these stories, it starts to make sense what grace is and what intentional grace looks like, how to show that to one another in the world around us. In Mark chapter 1, we read about Jesus healing a man with leprosy. And in that story, we're going to learn a lot about grace. It says that Jesus reached out his man, hand and touched the man to heal him. Now, Jesus didn't have to touch that leper to heal him. He could, touch, he could heal people without touching them. In fact, Luke chapter 7 tells us about a story where Jesus healed a man's servant without ever even going to the house where the servant was. Jesus didn't have to touch this man with leprosy. But in that touch, we learn a lot about grace. See, leprosy was a terrible disease, and it was thought to be very contagious. And so you, you didn't want to touch a leper. You didn't even want to get near a leper. So they had to live somewhere else. It would probably been many years since this man had felt human touch. And, and so when Jesus heals this man, we see his power. But in his touch, we learn about grace. That's the example. That's what it looks like to us. So how does that translate for us? It means we've got to take a little risk. We've got to get out of our comfort zone. We cannot show intentional grace by staying in our homes. We have to maybe 
hang out with somebody that's different than us. Maybe it means stopping and interacting with a homeless person, not just slowing down as you drive by and handing them a dollar bill. It means that we've got to take a little risk in our lives with other people. Following Jesus is not safe. And if anybody told you something different than that, they told you a lie in church. It is a dangerous thing, but it's also a beautiful thing. That's what it looks like to live like Jesus. Then in John chapter 8, we read about the story of Jesus walking up on a woman who was about to be stoned for committing adultery. The evidence against her was clear. She had cheated on her husband. No question about that. Stoning or killing by throwing rocks was the appropriate punishment under Jewish law. These men were doing what was right under the law. Jesus knew the law way better than they did. He knew that her guilt was real. And yet when he sees them, he says, guys, you have every right to stone her. But I think probably the, the guy that has never committed a sin probably ought to be the first one to throw a rock. And the Bible says that one by one, those men dropped their rocks and walked away. And after everybody had gone, Jesus just said, where's everybody gone? There's no one here to accuse you? And so she said, yes, Lord. Now, I wish the Apostle John had given us a little more of a picture of the emotion of that moment. Because can't you imagine it was intense? She, she would have had tears of joy running down her face because she'd just been saved from being stoned. She probably would have had tears of sadness running down her face because of the guilt of her sin. Incredible emotion. Jesus was filled to perfection with grace and truth. And so before this woman leaves, he says, go and sin no more. He gives her truth. But notice that he gives her truth after he shows grace. I'm sure she was a lot more willing to listen to Jesus' truth after she saw his grace. And, and that's the way it works. Truth works way better when it follows grace. And that's the way we want to be as a church. We want to love people right where they are all their faults, all their failures, all their sin, all their struggle. We want to show them intentional grace. And through that, we earn the right to share God's perfect plan for their lives. Grace should leave truth because truth is most effective when it follows grace. You know, there are dozens of stories in the Bible, and I could tell you story after story about Jesus showing grace, but we'd be here for hours and you'd never come back to the church so I'll tell you one more story. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, looking down at the people who had driven big spikes through his hands and his feet, as the blood was draining from his body, as life was leaving him, he looked down at those people and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He, he was saying, they don't really understand who I am. Think about that moment, that moment he is dying. They are killing him. And in the moment they are killing him, he's forgiving them. Now, that's one thing to forgive somebody after you've had time to reflect or after they've apologized for what they've done and the hurt is less real. But he's forgiving them while they're still calling him pain. That's what true grace looks like. And see, when we see it, this word grace that's so hard to define starts to make sense to us. We start to understand what it looks like because we get to see an illustration of Jesus and how he lived that out. We're called to forgive those who hurt us, even when the hurt is still real, even when they hadn't said they're sorry. We're called to love people that we disagree with. We're called to love people that hate us. As a church, we should be way more known for the things we're for than the things we're against. We should be way more known for our relationships than our rules. People should know what we love way more than they know what we hate. That's grace. That's what it looks like. Jesus sacrificed to show us how to be present. He sacrificed to show us how to live. Then here's the last thing. He sacrificed to show us how to find eternity. Jesus came to earth to show us how to live. But that wasn't enough to change history. That wasn't enough to change our eternities. It wasn't enough to show us how to live. He had to die for us and show us how to die so that we could be changed forever. Look at what Paul says in verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, 
He humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the gospel story. This is what Jesus did. And look, I know if you've been around church a long time, you're about to kind of dismiss what I say, and you go, I got this preacher. I've heard this story before. But, but I want you to just really think about the craziness of what happened, how unlikely this is. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was God, but he was also man, and so he experienced the exact same temptations that we struggle and fail with every single day. And yet he lived a perfect life. And then at the end of that life, he went to the cross, and he suffered and died so that we can be forgiven and set free. And yeah, we talk a lot about the physical pain of the cross, but do you know what the greatest suffering Jesus had on the cross? The Bible said that because God is a holy and righteous God, he can't stand sin. It makes him angry. And in that moment, Jesus, who had never committed a single sin, took on all of our sin. And the Bible says that in that moment, God had to turn his back on Jesus. What does that look like? Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus wore all our sin so that we could be cloaked in his righteousness. But in that moment when he did that, God the Father turned away from him. And I think the pain of that loneliness, that moment where God rejected him and turned away from him for that brief period of time was way worse than the nails in his hands or the blood that was draining from his body. He did that because he loves us so much that he wants us to have a relationship with this holy and righteous God. So when God sees us now, when we follow Jesus, he doesn't see all our sin. He just sees the beautiful blood of Jesus that covers us in righteousness. How amazing is that? Look, I mess up all the time. I don't have to go back weeks or years to talk about that. I can talk about this weekend. I mess up in some form or fashion almost every single day. I I probably don't treat my family the way I should. I don't treat my friends the way I should. I miss an opportunity to share my faith. I miss an opportunity to love someone like Jesus did. I'm not as much of a servant as I should be. I struggle with pride. And yet, how does Jesus seize me? God sees me as holy and righteous, not because of what I've done, but because Jesus loved me enough to die on the cross. Here's the thing. I don't know what your sin struggle is, but I do know the most important thing about you. Jesus died for you. And when he did that, he willingly took the anger and the holy righteousness of God all on himself. If you don't choose to follow Jesus, your your sin angers God. That anger is directed right at you. But Jesus took that sin so that God the Father would see you with Jesus' righteousness when you follow him. But it's still a decision. You have to take the last step. I've heard it said that if Jesus took 999 steps of 1,000, you got to take step 1,000. you got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and make him your Lord and Savior. Look at how John 3.16 says that. You guys all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's this beautiful promise there. But notice that it says you have to believe. That's the step that you have to take. You have to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he's done what he claims to have done, and then make him your Savior and Lord. We we celebrate Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, but that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is when he rose from the dead, and for the first time, he was acknowledged as God. Do you know that that Jesus was always co-equal with God from the beginning of time? But it wasn't until he rose to the dead that mankind first realized that he was equal to God. That was the moment. It was in that moment that this humble servant was revealed as a king. It was in that moment when eternity shuddered and Satan was defeated. That was the moment. When Jesus came to us 2,000 years ago, he came as a servant. When he returns again, he will come as a mighty king. This is the Jesus we celebrate and worship. 
This is the Jesus we proclaim. This is King Jesus. He is the reason and the power for all of creation. He is the culmination of all of history. He is why we are here. That's why we're here. So I want to end today by reading the last part of our scripture out loud together. I want us to read the Jesus that we worship. And so as we read these last verses, 9 through 11, I want you to think about this beautiful image of King Jesus. Let's read that together. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray.